Welcome back to the University of Southern California Institute of Armenian Studies and our series called After War, Before Peace. Uh, we are conducting a series of interviews with individuals who can help us understand the various aspects of this very complicated situation. I don't just say complicated conflict, it was always a complicated conflict. Today, it is a complicated situation post-war. Emil Sanamyan and I are trying to disaggregate the issues and deal with them in ways that help us understand the complexities, I can't say that word enough, the complexities, so that we can in fact do the studying, the exploring, the questioning, and the answering where they are impactful and where they will inform policy and change. I um, also sometimes think, and Emil and I have talked about this, that in many ways some ships have sailed. Uh, some things are being resolved willy-nilly, out of sequence, maybe not as wisely as they might be. Uh, but that is what it is, and we'll continue to talk to them uh, about them anyway, because unless these issues are explored and resolved, possibly resolved, there can't be a substantive, sustainable conversation that will lead, that will put us on a path to peace. That's a whole lot of steps before the peace. And without that path to a final determination, this uh, untenable situation will be very difficult for the people living on the ground, and of course for those monitoring and wanting uh, change, sometimes for the better, sometimes not. One of the aspects that needs to really be better understood is Russia, the role of Russia, the vision of Russia, the capacity and the limitations of Russia, and the expectations of Russia. Here to help us understand is Dr. Sergei Markadenov, a political scientist specializing in conflicts, nationalism, nation building in the post-Soviet space, and a researcher at the world-renowned Magimo, the Moscow State Institute of International Relations. Um, Dr. Markadinov, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for this invitation. Thank you for making the time. I know it is midnight for you. Um, I'm going to start with the first question, and I am sure that you and Emil are going to continue with all sorts of aspects to this. My first question is, is Moscow, in your view, at this time, satisfied with the status quo post-war? If it is, why? If it isn't, why not satisfied? And what can Russia do about it? Okay. Uh, first of all, I suppose it's uh, not quite possible to uh, talk about complete satisfaction from this situation or dissatisfaction. Russia tried to face uh, what it is on the ground. And um, first of all, um, I don't think that the uh, situation of 2020 and after uh, is uh, something new for Russia in this conflict. Uh, this conflict uh, didn't discover something new in Russia's behavior. Maybe it sharpened some things on the Russian attitude to the conflicts in the Caucasus and the post-Soviet state in general and in particular in Nagorno-Karabakh. First of all, the um, uh, outbreak of the conflict last year demonstrated absence of universal approach of Russia to all conflicts and conflict resolution. Because I suppose many uh, colleagues of mine in the West uh, have become hostages of 2014 events. Russian immediate reaction, Russian intervention, Russian answer, maybe military in military way, but Russia demonstrated a variety of approaches. In this case, uh, Moscow tried and uh, is trying now to balance between Armenia and Azerbaijan, not standing on one side, like in the case of Georgia. Uh, moreover, in Georgian case, prior to 2004 at least, Russia did the same. But then, due to the changing of situation, Russia changed its attitude, standing for Abkhazia and South Ossetia. As for now, um, Russia uh, feels itself uh, more or less uh, uh, strong because uh, it uh, has become leader in the uh, uh, ceasefire imposing in comparison with the two years of OSCE means group France and the United States. Uh, Russia um, is uh, proud to be uh, useful for both conflicting parties 
because both Armenia and Azerbaijan are in favor of Russian mediating activity. No Armenia, neither Azerbaijan protesting against Russian leading role in it. As for Turkey, Sergei, of course, Sergei, before are... we get before we get to Turkey, mm -hmm. um, why did Russia intervene when it intervened? Um, okay, uh, first of all, in, in, in this in this area, we should differentiate the approach of Armenia to the conflict and to the region in general, because for our experts and average Armenians, including taxi drivers or servants. No difference between Armenia, Karabakh, and areas adjacent to the conflict area. For Moscow, there were some differences. Nuclear Karabakh, Armenia, and occupied areas. As for seven districts outside of nuclear Karabakh, Russia was so skeptical to see them controlled by Armenia. As for nuclear Karabakh, we can see differences between approach of Baku and uh, Ankara as well in Russia. Because let's see on the Azerbaijani approach. Azerbaijani leaders treat this situation, uh, how to say, in the uh, past tense. They said everything is uh, over and we should think about economic restoration of the infrastructure and uh, something, uh, something else. Russian leaders are more cautious, saying, I mean here, Lavrov and Vladimir Putin, of course, that status issues are not completely resolved. It's necessary to uh, do something to make compromise, and now it's so early to make some final conclusions. Now, and last not the least point, last not the least point, Armenia. For Russia, it was clear that Armenian territory should be uh, excluded from the confrontation. In the cases of uh, offensive towards Armenia properly, I suppose Russian reaction would be very different from uh, one what we are saw uh, last November and October. This is why it's necessary to uh, differentiate those issues. It's not bad, it's, it's, it's not good. It's uh, the view of Russia, because after 2008 events, Russia lost uh, many instruments how to control Georgia, how to influence Georgia, and Moscow is not interested to see Azerbaijan like second Georgia. Outside I'm of its again, sphere. It's not bad. Yes, of course. It's it's not bad. It's not good. And, and do you want to jump in? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, well, I was going to ask about that. Uh, does uh, uh, the Russian establishment, you think, feels uh, stronger? Uh, has the Russia has a stronger position in the region at this point uh, after this war? Uh, or uh, is it a more complicated position because of the, the, the involvement of Turkey, because of Turkish presence on the ground? Okay, uh, <laughs> I, I tried to raise this question, was interrupted to clarify some other issues. Of course, the Turkish factor uh, promotes and provokes some, um, um, how do you say, uh, special reasons to think on the situation. This is why I started my intervention with phases that it's impossible to say about complete satisfaction or complete dissatisfaction. Because mm, some new realities uh, arose in the course of the outbreak of uh, last uh, year war and after. The role of Turkey is first and foremost. It's no coincidence that uh, Sergei Lavrov and Vladimir Putin said that we were and we are not allies. We are not interested to see uh, or to be engaged in the confrontation with Turkey. NATO member, by the way the second uh, biggest army in this military bloc, and so on and so on. But at the same time, we understand, uh, and uh, Russian officials as uh, and experts also, uh, problems arising after the new status quo shaping. Now we see uh, interest of Russia and Turkey to cooperate, not like uh, in the case of Syria, it's not um, uh, uh, the same situation, similar in some aspects, but not the same. But at the same time, we see some concerns because uh, we have now some points for potential collisions. Monitoring centers, joint monitoring centers, uh, military presence of Turkey, and um, a limited uh, term for the presence of our peacekeepers. If how we compare their conditions. Before the, the peacekeepers, how is any part of that 
acceptable for Russia, that the Turkish presence, monitoring group and the joint exercises, what uh, rationalizes that for Russia? Okay, maybe it's uh, not discovery of top secrets, uh, I would say uh, now, uh, of course, Russia would not uh, happier to uh, see its exclusive role in the region. It's, it's, it's understandable. It's not proclaimed officially, but it's clear. But, uh, of course, uh, the uh, politics is an art of opportunity, as it's well known. And this is why Russia sees the growing role of Turkey. Russia is not interested to be engaged in the confrontation, understanding that for the West it would be uh, maybe the best way to see two Eurasian giants confronting each other. This is why it tries to keep off this confrontation. But, of course, understanding their problems and collisions. I am repeating again the uh, thesis on the uh, limited term of the Russian presence. If we, we compare the conditions of peacekeeping deployment with previous operations in Abkhazia, Transnistria, South Ossetia, or Tajikistan, there were no special restrictions for presence of Russian militaries. Let's there imagine are then two, more, three. There are more yeah, restrictions. And, uh, of course, and uh, in uh, two, three, or four years, maybe even five years, we can uh, hear some voices maybe on their withdrawal of some demands. Now, no demands. Now we see uh, satisfaction of uh, Baku, in lesser extent Ankara, of the Russian peacekeepers on the ground, but it's not eternal, by the way. I'm not sure that this situation will be uh, continuing for uh, the whole term of uh, deployment of Russian peacekeepers. When you say this situation, what, what situation do you mean? This situation may not uh, continue through the whole term. What situation? A uh, situation with Russian peacekeepers on the ground, because it's interesting and rather paradoxical that all sides engage in the conflict in uh, greater extent or lesser extent, be it United States, France, Turkey, Iran, they don't object openly on the Russian peacekeeping presence. And let's see on Ilham Aliyev. In this context, I can remind you his December meeting with the uh, co-chairs so for a Siemens group. He blamed them, but blessing at the same time Mr. Putin. He said, Mr. Putin and me uh, changed the situation, blah, 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 and so on. But it's now. It's current situation. No 100% uh, guarantees that it would be eternal. Because, first of all, we see a uh, public opinion in Azerbaijan. It's not a country with competitive politics, but at the same time, I observe uh, and uh, monitor um, social networks, some uh, statements from the uh, journalists and even representatives of uh, younger generation who are not satisfied by the Russian presence. Sometimes it's compared with uh, uh, cases of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, and maybe this issue will be discussed, will be on the table to be discussed. And now, uh, right now, we should uh, fix the collision. Maybe this collision would not be realized, but Which it's collision? necessary to fix it now. Which collision? Collision between, uh, between uh, military presence and uh, final uh, resolution of the status issues. Because for Azerbaijan, everything is over. For Armenia, not quite. Russia um, claims to uh, maybe postpone um, the uh, final decision, not accelerating this problem. But uh, maybe in a year or two it would be more active to be discussed. Mr. Markadenov, as you know, each of the peace deals that have been on the table, beginning with President Ter Petrosyan's days, all the way through to the Lavrov plan. Maybe not the Lavrov plan so much, but certainly all of the others. All uh, gave a great deal of importance to the sequencing of events. Territory return, refugee return, status discussions. They were sequenced. They weren't all done simultaneously for obvious reasons, that, that the realities on the ground are going to have to change so that the sides can actually talk together and come to a, an acceptable final status. In this particular case, that 
cessation of hostilities document mixed everything together, the big, the small, the important, the not important, the long term, the short term. Why do you think that was okay for Russia, knowing as it does that this may not be the wisest way to do this for sustainable peace? Uh, first of all, we should uh, clearly define the uh, character of the document signed in uh, November 2020. Because many of uh, my colleagues uh, characterize it like a uh, uh, political document. It's, it's, it's not a political document like uh, a previous uh, Kazan formula or previous uh, a package plan or a step Madrid by step or, or radio yes. plan. Yeah, because it, it, it was a, a joint statement. It's, it's, it's not even a document. Officially, it was called, and uh, you can uh, see this formula on the uh, Kremlin website, joint statement of two presidents and one prime minister on ceasefire. I suppose that some um, problematic formula were excluded from this text because they uh, could not uh, stop hostilities at all in November. Uh, for Russia, it was important to stop hostilities first, uh, in order to prevent a scenario similar to Serbian Ukraine of 1995, complete sweeping of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, nuclear Nagorno-Karabakh, not uh, areas uh, adjacent to it, uh, in order to uh, start or to postpone after it the uh, status issues. I agree with you that everything were uh, on the table. Uh, the uh, conflict uh, issue uh, had two baskets. One of them was a uh, status of Nagorno-Karabakh because this issue uh, provoked uh, conflict itself. And the other problem, uh, clearly different, uh, maybe unique in comparison with Abkhazia, South Ossetia or Transnistria, fact of occupation of areas uh, uh, which uh, had not belonged to Karabakh, to nuclear Karabakh. It was not in the case of Abkhazia. Abkhazian troops uh, or paramilitaries didn't capture uh, some Georgian territories like Zubdidi or uh, something else. Uh, this is why there were two baskets. And uh, now in the uh, joint statement, we see some points concerning the first basket, the occupation or withdrawal of Armenian troops. As for status, these issues were not mentioned. But um, it's an interesting uh, case because uh, this document um, arose some questions, for example, about uh, uh, work and perspectives of Minsk OEC group first. Uh, question on the uh, status of Nagorno-Karabakh also. And uh, previous documents, uh, updated Madrid principles. Because uh, formally, uh, these uh, updated Madrid principles uh, were not uh, abandoned. Yeah. And uh, no, no, no special uh, statements about, uh, how to say, li liquidation of this uh, document to disappear. Many points mentioned there were realized not due to diplomatic measures, unfortunately, well, due to the warfare. If I may uh, jump in for a second, Sergei, uh, I, I liked your uh, term nuclear Karabakh. Uh, I guess it uh, kind of reflects the fact that now there is a nuclear power on the ground in Karabakh as well. Um, <laughs> beyond that, <laughs> I have a couple of questions. One is sort of future looking. Uh, how would you see, uh, what are the main factors that are going to be influencing Russian presence uh, in Karabakh in the, in the long term? Uh, meaning the long term is the five year period. Uh, beyond that, whether, uh, say, if uh, tomorrow or uh, next year Azerbaijan demands Russian withdrawal, would that be uh, satisfied with, uh, unconditionally or uh, would there be other factors influencing that? What would be the, the main factors driving uh, Russian military presence, peacekeeping presence in Karabakh beyond this declaration between the, the three leaders? Okay, first of all, I see the uh, current uh, uh, dynamics of Russia in, in, in uh, such a way. Uh, Russia sees that military presence is not enough. And uh, the uh, trilateral summit in Moscow demonstrated that Russia sees uh, some opportunities how to uh, strengthen its mediating role 
in the conflict, uh, promoting ideas of restoration of economic infrastructure, trying to uh, connect the two um, countries and uh, uh, its role as a mediating power. Um, it's uh, interesting and useful, but um, uh, I also have some, uh, how to say, skeptical uh, perceptions, because ethnopolitical conflict should not be uh, resolved only due to economic measures. Economic measures are interesting and useful. They uh, will give a chance, potential chance, to overcome, uh, to, to enlarge the uh, resolution technique, not only due to security measures. Economic it's, it's matters, you mean... Maybe. By economic matters, you mean transport, roads, Yes, of course. Trade, Transportation, that's... of course, uh, some uh, trade uh, and uh, engagement. But that's not going to happen. In, uh, that's, not, that's not going to happen in the next two, three years. In this first five-year period... Uh, can... uh, yeah, I, I'm so cautious that it will be uh, very fast. In due to many things, uh, not only uh, concerning the uh, geopolitical factor, but domestic factors also. Because uh, now the Armenian government faces a lot of problems inside the country, because uh, 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 opponents of power criticize it, and of course some steps to uh, resolution of the conflict could be perceived like treason, or something similar, and also uh, establish a lot of uh, troubles. But that's, um, uh, that's, certainly, for, that's certainly half the problem, but the other half the problem is the Azerbaijani rhetoric continues to be vindictive and punitive rather than rational and forward-looking at the highest levels, never mind that the, the commissions are taking place. So given that environment, if there isn't going to be economic visible improvement, what is going to be the determining factor for Russia staying or not staying in these five years? I suppose for Russia it would be kind of nightmare to be withdrawn only due to external pressures. It's, it's not typical for Russia to, to do such steps, uh, experiencing uh, external pressures. Uh, however, Russia previously demonstrated a readiness to make some concessions and compromises or to keep silence for two, three, four years. But at the same time, there are some red lines. In the case of Karabakh, Russia is not interested to uh, see uh, the uh, determination of the final status with no uh, engagement of it, engagement of Moscow. I, I suppose it's not a great idea for Russia. And I don't see a readiness of Moscow to uh, give up this game, to lose this game, with no concrete uh, engagement in, in it. Of course, we can predetermine, uh, predict even some uh, troubles with uh, military presence, some tensions. Uh, but Russia will uh, do everything to uh, exclude this scenario. It and does not mean that this scenario would not, uh, would not uh, appear at all, but it will try to uh, exclude uh, these developments because it will can establish I, a, lot of, in, a lot of troubles. Mm -hmm. Can I come up with one question on history, sort of historical question? Uh, history, by history, I mean the period between July and uh, September of last year. Um, was there, there were reports of communication between Erdogan and uh, Putin uh, in July and again later, but in July, most importantly, do you think uh, uh, the the amount of information uh, that Turkey was communicating to Russia was it uh, was basically was Russia informed about the the coming uh, war uh, was uh, uh, was uh, the, that sort of the warning from uh, Margarita Simonyan was that refre reflecting sort of this anticipation that the war was coming? And if so, was there any, what was the problem in terms of communication between Armenia and Russia about that in that period between uh, July and September? And let me add a Turkey piece to that since this is going to be our last question. And, and in Russia's decision making with Turkey, how much of this is in fact, about the regional matter and how much of it is the calculations about 
bringing Turkey closer to Russia and further from some of the Western structures? Uh, first, uh, there were no lack of uh, forecasts about uh, war in Karabakh, especially after escalation in July. A lot of forecasts in Russian media and uh, outside of Russia. This is why, of course, it was not a surprise. A lot of uh, military experts in Russia published forecasts about potential uh, escalations. So the problem was concrete date and the extent of the engagement. And the extent of Turkey's uh, engagement. Turkish engagement and, of course, uh, maybe uh, some points on the uh, military uh, stubbornness of Armenia were surprised, maybe. The speed of the offensive of Azerbaijan could be surprised, but not uh, offensive uh, itself because it was not top secret. Yeah, it was in the agenda of Azerbaijan to break status quo. Status quo was not seen as something satisfactory. It's, it's, it's understandable. As for Turkey, of course, I'm not sure that Russia sees Turkey only in the uh, framework of the Caucasus developments. It's, it's wider because previously Russia already uh, faced the uh, Turkish factor as a challenging one and at the same time uh, cooperative. Uh, usually in my lectures, I quote Gulen Taras and its formula on competitive cooperation between Russia and Turkey. We are not allies, I'm repeating again, but uh, a lot of points where interest of Turkey and Russia overlaps. In 2011, Russia broke um, the prerogative of Turkey for its near abroad in the Middle East, because uh, Turkey uh, considered it like, uh, uh, how does assassination attempt maybe, uh, on this uh, prerogative. Now uh, we see the uh, return of this pendulum to the Caucasus when uh, Russia treats this situation like challenge also. But uh, Russia sees Turkey in the greater context. You're absolutely right, uh, appealing to the problem of confronting between Turkey and the West, NATO and the West for Russia, the a uh, violation of uh, Euro-Atlantic unity is uh, treated like advantage. It's, it's, it's not secret, of course, because uh, mobilized and unified Euro-Atlantic structures are not in favor of Russia. And they try to punish Russia for revisionism in some uh, other areas. Of course, now uh, Russia sees uh, the uh, growing cooperation between Ukraine and Turkey with some concerns. Because in Ukraine, the Nagorno-Karabakh operation now is seen like um, uh, so something useful, maybe attractive. Previously, the case of Serbian Ukraine was treated like pattern, and now situation in Nagorno-Karabakh. It's, it's, it's dangerous, by the way. And the growing cooperation uh, between the military structures of Turkey and Ukraine also. Of course, Russia sees... Uh, the developments in Central Asia with concerns because now Turkey strengthened its position uh, in the Caspian Sea. And uh, the Caspian Sea sure is connected with Central Asian dynamics. Turkmenistan borders on Azerbaijan due to Caspian Sea and so on. So a lot, a lot of problems, a lot of challenges. Yeah. But for Russia, there are some interests. How to weaken the uh, Euro-Atlantic solidarity how to um, uh, prevent the growing confrontation or potential confrontation with Turkey not being a lie of this country. Of course, uh, some um, uh, concerns, some uh, maybe reasons are not uh, widely discussed, but we understand also some vulnerabilities of Turkey, lack of technological sovereignty. Yeah, Bayraktar became... Uh, kind of instruments how to weaken opponents, but they are not technological product of uh, Turkey, by the way. A lot of export things and so on. Vulnerabilities in economy and, of course, the uh, personal uh, position of Erdogan inside Turkey are um, uh, not indisputable, by the way. Uh, I understand that opponents of Erdogan, like David Aglu, uh, would not change their foreign policy priorities of Ankara dramatically. Thank they you. have some 
domestic uh, troubles, but in terms of foreign policy strategy, I'm not sure. Thank you for raising a great many facets of this bilateral relationship, Turkey-Russia, that we really need to be understanding better because it, of course, will continue to impact what happens in the region. Um, Dr. Sergei Markadenov, we're grateful to you for making the time and uh, uh, for not just answering questions, but asking new ones. Thank you very much. Thank you for your invitation. It was a rather productive discussion. Hope to continue our cooperation in the future. Thank you again. Absolutely. Bye. Thank you again. We will continue our conversation about Russia, Russia's involvement in the region, how Russia sees the region and the conflict, and how Armenians see how Russia sees the region and the conflict. And to do that, we're going to speak again with Garen Harutunyan in Yerevan. Garen is editor-in-chief of CivilNet.am, the multilingual news and analysis site, and is someone who spends a great deal of time following the Russian press. Garen, welcome. Garen, you are muted. Not muted. Not, not, not muted anymore. anymore. <laughs> um, Emil, you want to start with Garen? Yeah, I wanted to start on that uh, uh, question that I last uh, raised uh, about uh, the, the pre-war period, sort of the uh, because I think that's that's a significant uh, period to study, to understand uh, you know what could happen in the future in a similar type of uh, threatening uh, moment. And pre-war is which period? The July July to September. Twenty um, twenty. Uh, what? What was the sense in Armenia now that you recall in that period after July fighting and uh, as uh, Turkish forces were coming to Azerbaijan? Uh, was there a sense that, uh, you know, that uh, there's not a serious threat or was there a sense that there is a serious threat? Uh, what was the sense of Russia's role in the situation? There was this uh, sense of uh, anxiety after July events and the Armenian expert community and people who were well aware of the conflict and uh, about Karabakh were cautiously uh, observing what, what, what is going to be next. And uh, the next was the military uh, exercises, joint military exercises in Azerbaijan and in Nakhichevan. Uh, Turkish Azerbaijani military exercises and Armenia was watching and uh, uh, and was it, Armenia watching what Russia was watching? Armenia was watching and Armenia was too much self-confident, too much self-confident and you you could see that after July escalation, July, July clashes, there was the uh, we proved that the Karabakh conflict uh, has no military solution, etc. And this, there was sort of ignorance of Russia's role, etc. And when the war started in, in the end of uh, September, Armenia didn't apply either to Russia directly or to C CSTO. And it was too much self-confidence on. Um, but the... the the, not the Armenian Armenia perspective, but how Armenia was also seeing the Russian media. How what part of that confidence was also based on what we what the press was showing? It's the Russian. It's the understanding of the Russian perspective that we're trying to understand. Not the Russian perspective, but the understanding of the Russian perspective. Yeah, I see. And the Russian perspective was like uh, there were there was coverage about the Lavrov plan that was again uh, introduced to Armenia in 2019 and was rejected in May, two months before the July escalation in May. Uh, and this, this sort of discussion, but no special 
something special. No, I don't remember anything special. Emil, help me here. I think that we should explain that the Lavrov plan, just like all of the plans that came before it, tackled yes. four basic factors. Security. Well, what we know, yeah, what we know from, uh, you know, there's been several iterations of that plan. Um, I haven't uh, seen the, like, the firm uh, document that would be called. But I, I want plan. to open it up because I think that we're assuming yeah. that people but know it all the details. It essentially uh, flowed out of uh, the OEC Minsk Group proposal, which is also referred to as Madrid Principles, but uh, was an incomplete implementation of Madrid principles. And uh, from what we uh, understand from the revelations that have been made is that uh, the Armenian forces would have pulled out of five districts of Azerbaijan, which is uh, the four in the south and one in the east, Agdam. In exchange, uh, the Russian peacekeeping uh, deployment would have happened into the area and uh, sort of would, would have been a guarantee of non-resumption of war. Uh, sort of what eventually happened, minus Lachin and Kelbajar and Plus Hadrut fighting. and Shushan. Yes. So, uh, but, so, but again, I want to open this up just a little bit more because um, the Madrid principles, the Madrid document, the Kazan plan that came later, the Lavrov plan, which is the most recent, all of them tackle four things in different permutations, slightly different. One is the territories, which you just referred to the seven adjacent territories that were under Armenian control. How, what is their status? Are they returned? How were they returned? When are they returned? The other is refugees. The third is security. And the fourth is status. And that status issue has usually been tackled in the form of a referendum to be held at X period of time after some of these other things begin to happen. The Lavrov plan didn't have a referendum and didn't say anything about status as far as I understand. Uh, yes, it did not address status, and the status uh, had been addressed in different proposals differently. It started with uh, the efforts to sort of reintroduce the status quo ante, that's in the early mid-90s. Uh, basically, Armenians were told that you can only have some kind of a autonomous status inside Azerbaijan. Armenians, of course, rejected that approach. Uh, the following uh, sort of permutation was not to address the status. That's the 1997 proposal that Perpetrasyan supported, uh, where there would be withdrawals again in exchange for security guarantees, but no status uh, decision. Then you had the common state approach, which was in 1998, where Armenia, I'm sorry, uh, Azerbaijan and Nagorno-Karabakh would have created a common state, but essentially uh, it would be a, a, a nearly an equal relationship rather than a subordinate relationship that was rejected by Azerbaijan and the following that there was the discussion at Key West where Karabakh and Lachin would have become part of Armenia in exchange for Armenian withdrawal from all the other districts and also the sovereign passage into Mehri. Then we had the discussion of uh, uh, some kind of uh, status determination mechanism uh, where uh, people of Karabakh would have voted for in a referendum to determine their status, but really that would have been a pro forma thing because it's clear what the people of Karabakh want, do, want, do not want to be part of it. Azerbaijan. So it became an issue of postponing status and in exchange for postponement of status, uh, the Armenian control over Lachin and Kelbajar would have been maintained so that the uh, withdrawal from Kelbajar would be contingent on uh, determination of status. That was the latest Madrid principle approach and uh, coming into Lavrov. Contingent uh, on a Yes, uh, it, it was again the, removing the issue of uh, uh, status from the from the discussion for the time being, but also removing the issue of Armenian withdrawal from Kelbajar from Lachin, which would have been very significant. And of course, uh, the issues of uh, Shushi and uh, Hadrut were not on that agenda. They were, uh, you know, part of uh, the Armenian control nuclear Karabakh, as uh, Sergei Markedonov aptly called it. So that was the long about way of, of getting back to the Lavrov plan that got in, as you said, was you know, both offered and rejected. Got in, re, uh, respond to something that Sergei Markedenov said earlier about uh, the distinction, rather obvious legal distinction, between Russia's ability and willingness to jump into a conflict where Gharapakh, nuclear Gharapakh, he called it, the Gharapakh proper, the former Enkao, the administrative region that became the self-declared republic of Gharapakh, Artsakh. The difference between defending that sort of attack, protecting Armenians there, versus protecting Armenians if they were to be attacked in the Republic of Armenia. He made that clear distinction. Is that something that is perceived in Armenia, that distinction? 
Was it understood why Russia didn't come walking in the fifth day of fighting? It, it was perceived at the beginning of the war when the when the war didn't approach the borders of Sunik, but, but when the war has come to has approached to the borders of Armenia proper and Sunik, and there was this discussion if Russia would interfere and if this war is going to uh, spread into proper Armenian territory. So there was this discussion with public fear in Armenia and it still persists. It still persists. It, it's being manipulated by certain political circles that Sunik is going to be lost to Azerbaijan, etc. So it, it, it's a sensitive issue. It's still there. One last question is, does Armenia well, two questions, one for Armenia, one for Karabakh. Is Russia perceived as the protector or the occupier today, now, at this point? I, I, I couldn't catch the first part of the question. For Armenia, is Russia perceived as a protector or an occupier today? And then for Russia Karabakh. Is a, Russia is a protector or an occupier? Which one? Russia is definitely a protector. For That's how Armenia sees it. Yes, that's how Armenia sees it. That's how Armenians see it. And that's how especially Karabakhis see it. So in Artsakh, and it's the same? In Artsakh, it's more obvious because they see that the, the only option of their security is Russia now, especially given this talk about the reformation of uh, Karabakh Defense Army. What so is the talk about to, the reformation of Karabakh Defense Army? Uh, they, they are going to, to have a new form of self-defense. They are not going uh, Armenia is not going to, the, the conversation is this, that Armenia is not going to send conscripts to Karabakh anymore and they're going to have a special, uh, special forces, it could be called Gvardia or I don't know, whatever, but this is not going to be the same defense army that it used to be during all these years and to be under the Armenian uh, army under army army uh, chief army chief stuff command yeah 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 th this is this is uh, obviously uh has changed armenia is no longer uh you know the guarantor of uh karabakh armenian security uh that that role had uh, been uh filled by russia a russian peacekeeping force and uh you know that's the case that uh, has repercussions for overall armenian um, sovereignty as well because uh, armenia relies on russia to guarantee karabakh armenian security and also armenia security proper especially in sunik but also everywhere else basically i mean the only country that russia is not protecting armenia from at this point i think is georgia on that note um Garen, we'll say thank you to you for being available again and I am sure we will call on you again in the future. Thank you, Garen Harutunyan and Yerevan, editor-in-chief of CivilNet. And Emil, Thanks. thank you to you as well. Uh, we will conclude this episode and come back and speak again about all other aspects of this complicated conflict. The aspects that need to be explored need to be understood in order for the beginning of a path towards peace in the region. Thank you for following After War Before Peace. This is the University of Southern California Institute of Armenian Studies. We welcome you to follow these episodes on YouTube and of course the audio versions on all of the podcast channels. Thank you. <laughs>